Amen. We are in the teaching series of the red letter words of Jesus, the crimson words of Jesus. They have to be the most powerful words ever spoken by the greatest man who ever walked the earth, Jesus Christ, God's Son. They're powerful, they're real, if you believe. If you believe in God, if you don't believe in God, I'm asking you today to open your heart to hear this and to hear the words of Jesus so that they might impact your life and show you who he really is. Now, there's been many great words spoken by amazing people throughout history. Would you agree? Many men, many women, many people have said some amazing things. But for the words to be the greatest words ever spoken, they have to stand out above all other words, above anything anyone has ever said. They have to be life-changing words. They have to be words that have altered and shaped history. They have to be words that have been able to affect not just some or hundreds, but millions and millions. And they truly are the words of Jesus Christ. Did you know that not only did Jesus speak the greatest words that were ever spoken, he said, my words are spirit and they are life. They actually have a spiritual power. They are embodied and empowered by spirit and they carry life. Life like no other. Life that cannot be carried through anyone else. They are life itself for he is the creator. He is God. And when he spoke, life changed people's lives. Power came in. True power and true life. And there's been more words said about Jesus than any other person. There's been more poetry, more songs, more books. Take the influence of any other person. Some of the greatest people that have ever lived. But none of them have impacted the world like Jesus. That's why we need to take his words seriously. They're not just words. They are life. And so today... I want to share with you the seven I am statements, which I think and agree with many people that have studied the Bible, that know the words of God and know the words of Jesus, that these I am statements have to be the greatest statements spoken by Jesus. They are so powerful because they declare who God is and they call us to encounter and experiencing him in this way. Every I am statement we'll look at today are a challenge for you and I to encounter and experience Jesus, to be our I am. And when he said, I am, he was actually, it was such a pivotal moment because in that moment he was saying that he was the great I am, the one that the Israelites knew, the ones that had heard Moses say on behalf of God, when he went to Pharaoh, the I am sends me. God is the I am of your life. He is the almighty, all-powerful I am. So you have to ask yourself this morning, who is Jesus to you? Who is he? Or what is he in your life? And two, the second question I want you to ask yourself is, what will you do with his words? What will you do with his teachings in your life? In the Old Testament, in, in Exodus chapter 3, God says that he's the I am to Moses. And that was really saying that he was the unchanging, all-existent, all-powerful, almighty God. So Jesus turns up now, and in the Gospel of John, it's the only Gospel that records these seven I am statements. And John, being the disciple that was very close, he was in the inner circle with Jesus. He's the only one that records these words. And he records them for us so that we can have them, so that we can live in these words. So in John chapter 6, Jesus says, after a miracle of feeding the 5,000, the people have gathered, they've received food, they've had their stomachs filled with bread. Jesus makes the statement and he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Every person is born with a hunger. We all crave things in our life. And Jesus is claiming to be the bread of life. 
In the Old Testament, God had fed the children of Israel with manna, heavenly bread that fell. Six days a week, for 40 years, God fed them faithfully bread. Jesus is saying, I am the bread. I am the bread of life, this universal food. Every culture, universally, eats some form of bread. And he was saying so many things, and I could spend hours talking to you about the significance of the bread. But what I want to speak mostly about is that Jesus in this statement says, I am the bread that will satisfy your longing, your soul, your striving. The thing that you crave, the thing that you desire, the thing or the person or the situation that you feel you need to have satisfied. Friend, Jesus is the bread to satisfy that need. And of course, bread is good to eat. It fills your belly. It's great, whether it's flat, whether it's gluten-free, whether it's dark, white, yeast-free, whatever. Jesus wants to satisfy you. You know, the things that we do to replace that inner craving, those things that we fall into, I fell into them for a good part of my teenage life, was all because I was empty and hungry. Hungry, but I didn't know how to satisfy that hunger. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy the hunger and the longing in your soul. There's nothing you need outside of Jesus, friend. There's nothing that can meet the need that you're looking for. It's not found in a marriage. Marriage is a blessing. Marriage will be fruitful and incredible in your life, but it cannot satisfy the need in your soul. Only Jesus can satisfy your heart. Your longing, the man, the person, the I am is Jesus. He has to be the I am of your heart, of your longing. And unless you, unless you give him your heart, unless you long to be satisfied, that deep hunger won't be satisfied. You can come to Jesus for bread or you can come to Jesus because he is the bread He's the bread to me. Is he the bread of your life? Is he the sustenance? Are you eating of Jesus to be satisfied? Coming to church once a week or reading something in the Bible every now and then is not going to satisfy. It's being in true fellowship. It's eating. It's dining with Jesus. It's a personal experience and relationship. And if you can tell me that you honestly do that and you're still not satisfied, friend, I can only say you haven't met him yet. You haven't experienced this bread. If you're looking and longing for anything in your life apart from him, you still haven't let him satisfy you yet. Because in him you are satisfied. In him is everything you could need for that hunger that you have in your life. He satisfies. The second statement Jesus made was the, I am the light of the world. He claims to be the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. And if anyone, anyone follows me, he shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. The light, God himself. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, God is light. God is light. God is love. God is holy. God is light. Jesus carries and is light. He's not a form of light. He is light. Light exists in this world. He's the sun. He's the radiance of God. He's the power, the energy. The most powerful force in this world is light. Without light, we die. Nothing grows. Nothing lives without light. And this world is in darkness, spiritual darkness. And Jesus came to bring the light that would light up inside a man or woman's life. And then Jesus said, now I make you a light. You are the light of the world. 
you and I carry around this light in us if we've joined ourselves to Jesus through baptism. We have the light of God himself. And that light illuminates the darkness. As soon as the light comes in, the darkness must flee. Light and darkness can't exist together. So we can either be walking in the light, walking in the absolute light of Christ, where everything is a light. You see clearly. You see. If I get up in the middle of the night with no lights, and I have done this many times, the first thing you do is you are searching and you are desperate to try to see where you're going so that you don't harm yourself. And many of us find ourselves in darkness, spiritual darkness, because we haven't let Jesus come in and be the light. We haven't given ourselves and said, Jesus, I need you to come in and be the light. Be my light. Be my bread. Be my light. Be my light. Show me. No one that follows Jesus should be in confusion or in darkness. He's the light of life. And we carry that light. We see clearly where we are. And we see clearly through the word of God. He's the living word that lights up our path. He lights up every decision. He can light up everything that comes, every attack of darkness. Jesus is the light. He carries and is the light. And when we follow him, we do not follow any longer and walk in the darkness. We've had our eyes open. Like the hymn writer said, I found the light. I found the light. And when the light came in, everything now I could see. I could see. Are you in spiritual light, walking in fellowship with the light, or in spiritual darkness? Friend, Jesus wants to come in and light up your life so you can see. And he comes, he comes to us in this way because he's so good. He doesn't want us to be in darkness. But you can choose to follow and walk after darkness. That's your choice. And it leads to destruction, friend. It leads to your whole life falling apart because in the end, a life without Jesus is an empty, broken life. It just slips through your fingers. There's no stability. Jesus said his words, when we live them, when we act upon his words, we build a foundation in our life, a foundation that will hold your life up when the storms come, when the pressures come, and nothing will blow the light out. Nothing will blow the light out. Because he and you together are safe. This light is always going to keep you in the safe place because it will tell you what is right and what is wrong, what is light, what is dark. If you're in blindness, it's very dangerous to you. He lights up your life and everything in it. Amen. The third statement Jesus made and the fourth he made together, he said, I am the door. I'm the gateway. I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus says this with the claim also, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. All who have ever come in before me are thieves and robbers and the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and find, in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the shepherd gives his life for his sheep. The hireling, he's not the shepherd. He's one who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep, and he flees. And the wolf catches the sheep, and the sheep... Uh, and he scatters them. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known. Jesus wants to be your shepherd. Is he the shepherd? Is he really your shepherd? You know, we've got lots of mentors, we've got coaches, we've got so many people wanting to speak into your life. Who are you allowing to be the shepherd of your life? Jesus must be the shepherd. And Jesus is the door. 
And you know, the, the, often the farmer or the shepherd would have the sheepfold. The sheepfold was the place where the sheep would sleep. And so the gateway was really a gateway entrance to come home. And Jesus says, I'm the door, I'm the gateway that will lead you home. I am the gateway that will lead you into the family of God, into the protection of God, into the safe place for you to rest. Only Jesus can be that in your life. Jesus can be the gateway, the doorway between heaven and earth, between this life and the next. He's the door. He's the one that brings salvation. He says, I am the door. Come through me and you will be saved. You'll have life. You'll have safety. You'll have a family. You'll have a home. That's what Jesus offers. And that's powerful because there's many people that are just feeling deserted, alone, who will I follow? What will I follow? They're fatherless, they're motherless, they're orphans, abandoned, abandoned souls upon the earth, so many. And Jesus says, I am the door which leads to home. And I am the one that will be your good, the shepherd, and I'll be a good shepherd, and I'll lay down my life. And a good shepherd does that. A good shepherd is faithful. He tends for the sheep. God wants to tend for you. You can't look after yourself. We need a shepherd. We need Jesus to be our shepherd. We need him to feed us the right food. We need to eat what he feeds us from his words. These are the words of life, the ones that he gives. Not the words of man, not the words of even great people, but the words of life are from the words of the good shepherd. And he's a good shepherd and he says, I lay down my life and I gather the sheep together. And he will even leave the 99 sheep to go and gather the lost, confused sheep that doesn't know where they're going. And they're headed for a cliff of destruction, their own soul falling into destruction. Jesus will leave them to go and find them. He doesn't leave to go and find a rebel. He doesn't. But he will go and find the lost, that little lamb, that little baby lamb that's lost the group, lost where they should be. He'll go and find them and he'll go and gather them up. He'll put them on his shoulder and he'll carry them in. And that's what Jesus is to you. Anyone that doesn't experience that is not allowing the shepherd to be their shepherd because this is what he does for me. He's picked me up time and time and time and time again. If I go anywhere outside where I should be in my mind, in my heart, the good shepherd pulls me in. Come here, picks me up, carries me, loves me, nurtures me, feeds me, watches me. That's what he does for you. That's what he can do for you. But you've got to let him be the shepherd. You've got to let him be your head, your leader. A lot of Christians don't want to be shepherded. They'll just go here, there. They run, they scatter. You have to submit your life to Jesus. You have to submit yourself in a place and allow the shepherd to shepherd you. And he'll do that through a church. He'll do that through a pastor. He'll do that through someone that will take responsibility and carry that responsibility before God. That's no light thing. A true shepherd will do that. Jesus laid down his life for us and he proved his love when he died on the cross. He did what no one would ever do for you. That's why he deserves to be the good shepherd of our life. And he says, I know my sheep. And we hear his voice and we know it's him. We do not follow the voice of another. We do not follow the voice of someone else. We follow the voice of the shepherd who knows us. And we want to follow him. No one's dragging us we want to be with him, just like a child hears the voice of his father, of his mother, and they know their voice. You know, a baby in the womb knows the voice of his father, of their father, before the baby's even born. God has designed us to need to have that for survival. Your spiritual survival depends upon you letting Jesus be your shepherd and feeding upon him feeding and letting him lead you. The next statement Jesus made was, I am the resurrection and I am the life. 
He said, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, this is almighty. This is a powerful statement. This is after he's done his final miracle before he's soon to be arrested, arrested and he's going to go through Gethsemane and then he's going to be tortured and killed on the cross. This was his big, big miracle that would leave everyone completely stunned. Lazarus was dead for four days. Dead, dead, 100% dead, not breathing. His body was decaying in a tomb. He was dead. And Jesus went over to the tomb and he told him to get up and get out. And he brought life to a dead man. And that's exactly what Jesus says to you. He can bring life. Are you dead in your sin? Are you dead in your life? Are you decaying with anything in your life? Jesus wants to bring resurrection power to that part of you. He wants to bring you out of the dead, out of the sleep, out of the decay in your life and resurrect you with life that is from heaven, life that is powerful. There is no dead situation that Jesus Christ cannot bring life to. He can bring life to a dead marriage. He can bring life to a dead relationship. He can bring life to a dead body. In fact, if you and I believe this, we would be seeing a lot more of it and we'll be releasing a lot more of it. But God brings people back to life. We've had people being brought back to life in this ministry. We've had death sentences reversed. We've had people with cancer, terminal cancer. God has healed them because he's the resurrection and he's the life. Why should that offend us? Why do Christians get offended when Jesus wants to release resurrection power? Why does the church look at that and think that there's something wrong with that? What could be wrong with raising the dead? Why do people get upset when someone preaches what I'm saying here? Why do people want to pull that down? Is it because you fear? You fear? Why do we put a doctrine before what Jesus said here? What Jesus did? Jesus said we were to go out and we are to release healing and power and resurrection life. He said, those that believe in my name, in Mark 16, will go out and these signs will follow. Now, either it's true or either it's rubbish. Is it true? Is he the resurrection in your life? Is he the resurrection in me? Why aren't we doing it? Why am I not doing it enough? I try. I try. I want to see it happen and I believe it will happen. But I want to challenge us. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Where and what am I doing with this? What are you doing with it, evangelist? What are you doing with it, prophet? What are you doing with it? Where is this power of resurrection life? It's real. He is not the one who fails in releasing this power. The only reason it's not manifested is because we don't believe it. And that's why Jesus said at the end of the statement, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because if you believe that Jesus is the resurrection power, why does any addiction have power over you? Why does anything that comes against you have any influence to be able to affect you, upset you? That resurrection, resurrection power is ours now. It's not just when we die. We will be raised. Hallelujah. But this is for now. And he said, it's the resurrection power and the life. I get up. You get up every morning and choose to live in the resurrection power or completely reject it. But he says, I am the resurrection power in you. I am. I can't resurrect a thing, but he can. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. But this is a challenge for me. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, one of the great evangelists, 
He visited Melbourne. He came to this city. We can't say it doesn't happen here. He came to this city in the 50s. He went on the trains in our city of Melbourne. And when he was praying on those trains, the power of God was so powerful that people were afraid and they fell down under the fear and awe and reverence of God, like the book of Acts. People were covering their heads with boxes because they felt like on top of the train something was crushing down on the actual train. And when he got out, he raised the dead, he healed the sick, and he embodied this resurrection and life power. What I think has happened, my my brethren, listen, the thing that has happened is fear has got to us. We're afraid. We're afraid to shine our light. We're afraid to show the bread and share the bread. We're afraid that if we pray for someone, if we talk about this resurrection, if we lay hands on the sick, that it may not happen. Therefore, we don't want to look bad because we're full of pride. Because we still care what others may think of us. And so we don't. And little by little, little by little, we lose that confidence, that hope, that power. And so that's exactly what the devil wants. So this morning, I want to tell you on behalf of God, he says, you have the resurrection power. You have the bread. You are the light. You can take my words. I in you can do these things. I in you. I am the one. I am the one in you. I am. Jesus also said, and this is the most controversial of all statements, I think, in John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus here is not claiming to be one of the ways or some of the truth or a form of life or a way of life. He's absolutely declaring himself here to be the only way to God. Friends, Jesus Christ is the only way to meet God the Father. There is no other way. There's nothing you could do. And he was saying this to a bunch of people who had Greeks and Jewish customs, ways, mythologies, ordinances, regulations, rules, all these things that they did that they thought, I do these things, I practice these things, these are the way to please God. Jesus stands up and he says, I am the way. I am the truth. To the Jews, Jesus was the way instead of all those sacrifices, all the 613 regulations and rules. To the Greeks, he's saying, I am the truth. You guys listen and love your ideologies, your mythologies, your customs. I am the truth. Jesus isn't a version of it. He is truth. That makes every other religious belief false. It makes every other religious way, every other thought, pattern, idea that man has. Your best friend could have it. Someone in your family could be the loveliest person and follow a person like Buddha or Muhammad or some other religious person that never rose from the dead, never did the signs and wonders that Jesus did. Their bodies lay in the ground, not the body of Jesus though. The body of Jesus was raised out of, the, out of the ground. 500 people saw Jesus. No one saw Muhammad and no one saw Buddha or Krishna or anyone else. They were not God. So Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Now you can accept it and live in it and experience it or reject it but you cannot deny it. You have to do something with this Jesus. In a great book written by Josh McDowell, the book's called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Read it. One of the great Christian, great Christian men who was an atheist who converted to Jesus, C.S. Lewis, says, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said 
would be, would, would, sorry, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the Son of God, or else he was a madman or something worse. You cannot shut him up. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But none of us, let not any of us come with some patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left us open to this. He did not intend it to be opened. Jesus is not a version of the truth, but the truth. He's not a version of living. He is life itself. And by following him, you can know that you have the sustainer and the creator and the almighty living in you. Hallelujah. And the last great I am, the one that holds it all together, Jesus. We heard last week such a wonderful message. Make sure you hear it from Pastor Sebastian. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and my father is the wine dresser, the gardener. Jesus is the trunk, the vine. Nothing has life on this vine without him. We are the branches. We grow off him. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. This is so important that you understand this. Is Jesus the I am vine in your life? Are you connected to the vine and grafted through the Holy Spirit to feed off him? You have to feed off Jesus in the word, in fellowship, in communion, in personal relationship, you alone with God, you longing and knowing and loving him above anything else. Experiencing Jesus as the I am is feeding off his life. Nothing satisfies. He's the bread. He's the light. He's the door. He's the shepherd. He's the resurrection. He's the life. He's the way, truth, and life. And he's the vine. To abide in this vine means I yield, I surrender. Will you surrender to the I am? Could you surrender to the I am? Who is Jesus? He's the I am. And when the I am is in our lives, we get to experience and live out these I am statements. He is truly our bread. He is our light. He is our door, our shepherd. He's our resurrection every day we get up and we rise and live for him. He's the one that we abide and then the fruit the good things of him grow out of us. We cannot do it alone. God has grown everything in my life, not because of me. I have a, gl a good life. I think I have a great life. But my life is only what it is, friend, because I have yielded. I have eaten. I do live. And I want to experience more and more of that. I haven't become anything close to what I could. There's always more. There's so much more. And I want you to take the words of Jesus, not as some great experience, but as your very life. You yield and cling so that God can produce fruit and people will desire that fruit. But not so that you look good, so that he, Jesus, is seen. Jesus is experienced. He is the great I am and the only one that could be that in your life. Amen.